Atoa. Good afternoon. Today I'm joined by the Environment Minister, David Parker, as we announce further action by the government to accelerate our economic recovery from COVID-19. But first, I'll run through the week ahead, a week that will see the opening of the 53rd New Zealand Parliament. Tomorrow I'll speak at the Primary Industry Summit. Our food and fibre sectors continue to be the backbone of our economy and our response uh, in terms of ensuring that we're holding up well uh, with exports up 3.6% to the year ending June. Uh, and that is despite the impact of COVID. So they will play a critical role in our recovery. I will also attend caucus a little late where we'll have the official team photo. Uh, Wednesday is the commission opening of parliament where we elect a speaker and MPs are sworn in. Thursday is the state opening of Parliament, including the speech from the throne and the address and reply debate um, that I will take part in. On Friday, I'll be in Gisborne for the Charter Parade and Civic Reception to mark the inaugural visit of HMNZS Manawanui to her home port of Gisborne. Uh, I was honoured to become the Manawanui sponsor in June 2019. I'm very much looking forward to catching up with Captain Andy Mahoney and also with the crew while they are there. This afternoon, I had a very positive and warm phone call with US President-elect Joe Biden. I pass on New Zealand's congratulation on his election victory. Much of the call focused on the desire of our two countries to work cooperatively on a range of issues of mutual interest. We discussed COVID-19 and the President-elect spoke positively about New Zealand's response to the pandemic. The President-elect also stated that was his number one priority and I offered to him and his team access to the New Zealand team and health officials in order to share our experience and the things that we've learned on our COVID-19 journey. While New Zealand has a number of natural advantages that have assisted us in managing the virus, I do absolutely believe that international cooperation continues to be key to getting the virus under control and we are happy to work with any country to share our knowledge and data if it's helpful. But again, I do acknowledge that we have some natural additions such as our uh, border, which has enabled us to put a, uh, be in the position that we are. We also discussed climate change and the President-elect's plan uh, around uh, uh, emissions uh, within the United States, his goals by 2050, the Pacific region and global trade. The President-elect said he would like to reinvigorate uh, the relationship, um, noting the breadth of areas where there is agreement um, while recalling the long-standing nature of the relationship between our countries as well. Coming back to today's announcement, which is the next step in the government's acceleration of New Zealand's economic recovery from COVID. Today we are announcing additional projects that are being approved by Cabinet to go through the RMA Fast Track process. The COVID-19 Recovery Fast Track Consenting Act came into effect in July, and it's one of our levers to boost jobs, speed up infrastructure development and still improve environmental outcomes uh, in response to the economic impacts of COVID-19. Infrastructure is core to our recovery and ensuring we get key projects running quickly will provide the construction sector with that certainty within their pipeline. And of course, 17 projects were named in the fast track law and the Environment Protection Agency has already given the green light to the first one, a water storage reservoir in Kaikohui that is estimated to result in 60 full-time equivalent jobs and increase local GDP by $9 million a year. Speeding up the consenting process means that the job projects are able to deliver much-needed short- and long-term employment opportunity in the regions and act as a catalyst for regional economic growth sooner. Importantly, some will also add to the delivery of much-needed housing. I'll hand over to Minister Parker now to share details on the process and the projects themselves and their expected benefit. Minister Parker. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, today we're announcing another three projects from uh, various parts of the country that are being referred to expert panels for consenting under the Fast uh, Track Consenting Act. These uh, three projects are all private sector projects. The uh, three projects are firstly a Dominion Road mixed-use commercial and residential development in Auckland. 
uh, a factory, the Ohini, Ohiniwai uh, Foam Factory in Huntley, and the Vines Subdivision in Richmond. So that's a large development in Auckland and two that uh, will boost the regions. Uh, to give you an example of the scale of the Ohiniwai Foam Factory, uh, the site is 27 hectares. The factory that's going to be built, if it gets a consent, is 23,710 square metres. It's a big project and it involves its own rail spur. Uh, speeding up the consenting processes means that these private sector projects have the potential to deliver jobs sooner. All three, if all three of the projects gain approval together, they would uh, create an estimated uh, 2,000 jobs during the construction phase and around 200 permanent jobs once the projects are completed. They'll also enable up to 160 new dwellings in areas of high demand for housing. The COVID-19 Recovery Fast Track Consenting Act is one of the government's levers to boost jobs. It speeds up uh, can speed up infrastructure development and, and uh, improve environmental outcomes. It doesn't replace or circumvent the environmental test that is in the RMA, but it provides alternative process pathways for speeding up decisions on uh, resource consents and, as I said, preserves the environmental safeguards that are in the Act and also Treaty of Waitangi provisions and uh, settlement agreements are also adhered to. There are three routes under that Fast Track Act, uh, as some of you might recall. The first of those were the projects that were named in the Act. The second is referrals, such as those which we've named today. Uh, the most recent uh, application that we've received that will uh, proceed through this uh, is the uh, will, will be considered as to whether it should proceed in this as uh, the new Dunedin Hospital that will be coming through probably after Christmas by the time that's processed. The third route is the uh, repair and minor upgrade and maintenance works on existing infrastructure that's done by Kiwi Rail or New Zealand tr uh, Transport Agency. Um, subject to certain standards, those sorts of work can be done as of right now rather than requiring a resource consent. As the Prime Minister has already said, the fast track process has already seen the Matawai Water Storage Reservoir in Kaitaia approved. It was one of the projects that was named in the Act. That's already been approved by an expert consenting panel. It took 55 uh, days. That's uh, half the time it would take in a normal process, even if it wasn't appealed. And even if it was appealed, it, obviously that could take an extra year or so. Decisions on the projects that are announced today are expected uh, early in 2021 by an expert panel. Thank you, Minister Parker. Prime Look, Minister, we're now um, happy, though, to take questions. Prime Minister, did you, uh, Jessica. did you extend an invitation to Joe Biden and did you receive one to visit the White House? Uh, yes, I did extend an invitation. Uh, look, we, we know that... Um, uh, there has already been an invitation extended via Australia as part of uh, the anniversary of ANZUS next year. Um, and so it seemed only natural, of course, um, that we extend equally that invitation to New Zealand as well. I can tell you that was very warmly received by the President-elect. Um, he spoke of his fond memories of visiting New Zealand several years ago. Um, you could tell from the conversation he sensed a real connection um, to New Zealand, felt very welcomed here uh, and was very um, pleased to receive the invitation um, to come back here. Did you get invited to the White House as part of that phone call? Oh, look, uh, whether or not or when uh, a visit like that may take place um, is entirely a matter for the White House. Obviously, everyone will be taking into account um, the fact that we have border closures uh, right now. Uh, so that is something that I leave um, to the White House. But we did talk about the fact we were both looking forward to the opportunity to meet face to face. If you did get an invitation, could you tell us? Or uh, I would probably be quite caveated about that. <laughs> Sorry, did you It, no, look, it was very much, you know, looking to the future. Uh, you know, as you can imagine, I wanted to focus the time that we had on the areas where we're really keen to work together. Issues um, like, for instance, trade. We spoke about the importance 
uh, of organisations like the World Trade Organisation to a country like New Zealand, um, the ambition that we have for resolving those issues, the role we've played to date and our eagerness to support uh, work to unblock some of the issues that we've experienced. Uh, so we mostly, the time was dominated by talking about uh, the next steps uh, in our relationship. Okay. Look, you can um, see actually from the statements that are being made publicly by the president-elect that a real priority, the number one priority, as he said, um, was the response to, to COVID-19. He spoke very favourably about what he had seen happening in New Zealand and a desire to exchange further information and discuss what we had learnt. So that was an offer um, that I said we would be happy to help with. I imagine that I imagine that there will be ongoing dialogue that may take um, place at an official's level, but that's an offer we were, we were very keen to respond to. Um, Jenna. Oh, so I, I think that was a way of expressing um, more actually the enthusiasm that was that I heard in the call to work together on areas where we have, you know, really some common goals. Um, I would add to that list climate change, uh, and also, as I've said, um, a desire to work constructively on trade issues. Um, and he has an interest in our region, not only stemming clearly from his visit here and the positive impact that had, but he spoke of um, the time that his uncle served in the war in this region. Obviously, that has um, impacted on him and uh, his interest in making sure that the United States is present um, in its engagement um, across the globe, but particularly here. I'll come to you in a moment. I'll just let you finish, Jenna, and then Barry. There will always be differences in the way that leaders will operate and the relationships that they may already have and their engagement with a country that they bring into the job. Um, but certainly from that first call, I detected a huge amount of enthusiasm for the relationship that we already have, but the potential of that relationship too. Um, um, yes, um, would Barry. You, would it be fair to say, it probably goes without saying, that this is a formal acknowledgement that uh, Donald Trump has lost the election of Joe Biden? Well, as uh, you will have seen, um, we already uh, have extended as a government on behalf of New Zealand. Uh, we had already extended our congratulations to the president-elect, so had recognised the electoral outcome, and this phone call was a follow-up to that. You'll see that we are in the company of a number of other countries that have done the same. Uh, and so we, we are amongst company in that regard. I said he wanted to reinvigorate. Again, uh, that's my characterisation of the phone call, that there was a real enthusiasm for us to work together in areas of common interest um, and uh, the opportunities that existed uh, across both learning from uh, our COVID, you know, talking about our COVID response, uh, the work that we uh, all want to be doing, and uh, now obviously the United States are adding themselves to that list around climate change and trade issues as well. I want to go back and exactly check the wording there, um, whether or not that was the precise word that was used, but that would be my characterisation of the phone call. Right, yeah. so when, you, when you offered yes. um, uh, expertise on the, on the virus, did, did that sound like um, the person that let Biden would take you up on that offer? And Sorry, what was that? Will take us up on the yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, look, I I doubt that he would have said that he wanted to discuss uh, the issue further unless that was something he wanted to do. Uh, whether or not that's done by at officials level or whether or not that's done at leader level, in my view, the impact or uh, what we can offer is the same. So that was something that he offered that he was interested in engaging further on on COVID issues. <laughs> With the one caveat, I, you know, as I've said, you know, we, we're always aware of the fact that we have uh, natural attributes that have added uh, to our ability to respond to COVID in the way we have. Our borders um, is one element of that. Uh, so it has meant that we've had some natural advantage, but keep in mind we've acted on that. 
Uh, we've had that advantage and we've used it to positive effect. Um, but it does mean that I'm very, you know, I'm very aware that what we've done won't be able to be re replicated exactly everywhere. But there are many other learnings within that that we're, of course, happy to share. No one country's experience has been linear or has been perfect. And we've all learned things from one another along the way. But I think we should all um, share both those areas where we've had to learn hard lessons or where we've had positive lessons. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister, what sort of learnings did New Zealand offer to parents as an art of this? That we could offer? Look, I think, you know, what has been really at the centre of our response has been some fundamentals around testing, contact tracing, um, isolation. That's over and above, of course, what we've done at our borders. So th those elements have been key. But we, of course, have also tried to use technology, but keeping in mind that we've done it in a way that um, fits with, you know, social licence. We've we've used technology with people's permission. Uh, in some countries, they've you know they've used technology in a range of different ways. I think in our case, we've tried to bring people with us in, in that use, and so we've learned I think from that too. So those are just a couple. Not all will be applicable in every economy, but we can only share what we've done. Yeah. Jane. Oh, look, look, I do take it as a, as a positive. I think it's a signal that, uh, you know, that actually relationships are about more than size. Um, they're about um, more than necessarily, you know, what um, uh, groups you belong to as a nation. Actually, it's about relationships as well. And I do think we have, um, through different leaders of all persuasions, we have had very strong, solid relationships with the United States. My intention is to continue and to strengthen that. Do you hope that they do take a more multilateral, um, outward-looking approach than under Donald Trump in terms of trade and, and various other areas that, that is, New Zealand really built? And that is certainly the sense I've come away from that initial conversation with, is that not only was I um, offering the view that, you know, in areas like, for instance, the WTO, we've been a bit advocate uh, of you know, revitalising the organisation and working through a number of issues actually previously under the leadership of Minister Parker, and we want to continue in that. Uh, I get the sense that there's a real appreciation there for the importance of those organisations to us. Just on the RMA um, announcements today, mm. I mean, 160 dwelling said in the press release, which is quite a lot. Given the fact that your government is under a lot of pressure um, in terms of delivering housing at the moment, do you expect to be more fast-tracking of the RMA? I'll let Minister Parker speak to that as well, but what I would um, say is is that it does, you know, it, it is triggered by those developers coming forward and making those uh, applications and ensuring that their project is able to be considered for fast tracking. And I really encourage that. These are opportunities um, to utilise a process to expedite both housing, both jobs, and a pipeline of work for the construction industry. Yes, if, if I could just endorse those comments. We're trying to improve the supply of both houses and house building opportunities by increasing the supply of both. We've done that through changes to the national policy statement already under the RMA, and this is another route to assist for those who bring their applications to us. And the Prime Minister was saying that um, people have to come forward and develop this. There are many people in the pipeline at the moment, many developers that have already got something large storage, do you understand they will be lodging something? Uh, we've, we've, we've had a constant stream of them. Uh, the, the initial ones were more around retirement villages. Uh, this latest batch includes both houses and uh, a subdivision, mm -hmm. and we're interested in receiving more. Can you Joe. give an indication of how many houses you're talking about that, that could be in the pipeline and could be used? Uh, no, I can't just off the top of my head, but I can come back to you on that. And mm. on the announcement today, the 200 jobs, can you just explain the ones that in the future, the permanent jobs, can you explain where they come from? Are they basically all the phone factories? Uh, they would be uh, mainly in the phone factory. I don't think we've counted uh, the jobs in respect of the houses that would be built on the subdivision of uh, near Blenheim. Mr Parker, yep. on the RMA, could you envisage some of the big roading projects like the Mount Messenger one in Taranaki and in 
serving the Romanji Gorge being used uh, with this act to get them going quickly? Perhaps, yes. There's, there's no prohibition on those sorts of activities. Uh, indeed, the list that was in the original act, did that include Manawatu? I can come back to you on that. Mm. 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 Yep, of, Tina. How much does diversity of gender, age, ethnicity contribute to diversity of thought? Hmm. It's a good question. I think, you know, there's no doubt that we strive to make sure that we have a representative place in Parliament because... Uh, you bring your life experience to this place, you bring your connection to community, um, and you can speak to those experiences. And it does mean that we, therefore, consider our responses in a way that uh, is, uh, you know, reflective of the communities that we are meant to serve. I never, however, take it as a given um, that simply because you're a woman, you'll always speak um, favourably on issues that are supportive of, for instance, women's rights. And I say that having been in this parliament as I've watched ministers for women's affairs in the past um, vote down extensions to things like paid parental leave. So I don't take it as a given, but you can assume that greater diversity does lead to, uh, to that being reflected in the decisions made. And just on our COVID response, do you think that that could be replicated in the United States? in such a divided country, part of the, um, I guess, success of New Zealand was the yep. country uniting behind it. And look, we have to keep in mind there is advantage to the way that our system works, to the fact that we are a, a population of roughly 5 million, that we have, uh, in that sense, the ability to operate a response across our entire country. It's not complicated um, by uh, uh, multiple layers of system and governance, and that, and that has been to our advantage. So I never assume that what we do or have done can be easily replicated. However, there are some elements that actually, just by sharing, we leave up to other countries to determine whether or not that is something that can be usefully used. I should say, um, we, we also utilise the research that we see coming out of uh, for instance, the CDC and others. So it isn't one way. We are constantly looking into the information that's coming out of other countries, and I would include in that the United States. It is very much a two-way learning street. Prime Minister, back on housing. Yeah. Prime Minister, what action can we expect from the government after the Children's Commissioner's report that was out today? Yeah. Look, you know, I said this morning, and I stand by this, you know, in the wake of the release of that report, uh, no one wants to see children uplifted from um, their families' homes, but we all want to see children safe. So ultimately the debate we're having is about how to reach that objective where children aren't needing to be uplifted anymore. Um, I do think that you know, we have started to make some progress um, by working much more closely with organisations that have those relationships on the ground with iwi, with whānau. We want to do more of that. We've already seen a reduction in the number of Māori children who are being uplifted. So it's all about expediting and speeding up what we're already doing. Um, Minister Davis, though, has a very clear uh, view on these issues. He is meeting now with Oranga Tamariki's harshest critics to work through how we continue to work in the best interests of all children, including Māori children. Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Prime Minister I'll, let you, I'll let you ask a follow-up question. Well, one of the things that I've said this morning was that, you know, ultimately at the moment the responsibility for making a decision around the uplift of a child sits with the state because that is one of the hardest decisions I think that can be made and then one of the hardest things to carry out. You know, I think the conversation that needs to be had is does, you know, it, it sits with us for very good reason because it is such a significant use of power. But the way it has been done has been hugely problematic. And so rightly now we've had four reports all looking into this issue and now it's our job to act on that. But we're not going to do it unilaterally, otherwise we'll end up repeating our mistakes. Prime Minister, well, would you introduce to to that About what's something that's currently happening in the family court. We've got a new Chief District Court judge mm. who is of uh, uh, Maori ethnicity and he's uh, focused on trying to improve uh, outcomes for Maori children and so he's just in the process of rolling out the alcohol and other drug therapeutic courts, courts to yeah. Hamilton but they've traditionally only been used in respect of criminal courts. They're now going to be available to the family courts. Mm. So where there is a problem within a family 
which relates to alcohol or drug dependency of perhaps the mother, there will now be a therapeutic route to dealing with those issues rather than relying on Oranga Tamariki to perhaps mm -hmm. pursue other remedies. Mm -hmm. Can we keep in mind, of course, we've got the Waitangi Tribunal also yet to report to, so I imagine it will also point to some of these back issues and the path we need to go. Mikey. Would you introduce a land tax to crack down on land bankers and also speculation? How would you rein that in? Yeah, look, you know, roughly... We're talking 5 to 20 per cent of land, uh, a 2018 report has pointed to as possibly being in the category of being land banked. You know, I think this is something that we are all uh, not just frustrated by, I think it's probably a source of um, uh, people being infuriated by it when we're in a situation where we're trying to develop housing uh, for those who critically need it. We have already moved on a national policy statement that says to councils, look, we want development up and out, um, but uh, land banking is also one of the issues we're trying to commission some advice to see what is it that we can meaningfully do to deal with this frustration. So will that include a land tax? That, that advice that you're seeking, have you asked them to look into a land tax? Oh, we've, we've asked for advice on what to do around land banking. Um, but of course, you'll know the position we've taken on those issues at the election, and we'll be sticking to it. And that. what about oh, speculation? Uh, look, I'll come back to you, Joe, and then Thomas. Just back on this morning's report, the key recommendation in it was to transfer power and resources to a buy Māori, for Māori approach. Do you fundamentally agree that that is the right model? You'll see that we are already moving towards uh, agreements and arrangements with Māori, with you know the Māori Women's Welfare League, um, with iwi, uh, to take on a much greater role in some of the preventative work that previously would have been part of Oranga Tamariki's remit. So you're already seeing that. I think one of the things that Minister Davis has been right to point out, though, you know, roughly, you know, when you've got more than 5,000 children in care, if all of those children, you know, were suddenly changed up and where they were being cared for and how, are we ready for that? We do need to keep, keep making change. It does need to be in partnership. It's just the speed at which we can safely do that. Because some Māori organisations would say that at the moment it's when things get really bad, then they're consulted and that they're not actually running the programme. It's still a state programme and, yes, they might have a consultative role um, at an iwi level or whatever, but the, the recommendation is for Māori to actually own it and to actually... Whereas actually, whereas actually what I'd say is that one of the issues is that some of that um, arranged, those arrangements have been very much in the preventative space and in the early space, and where we've had a lot of our issues is around the um, exercise of that big decision around uh, a child coming into care, those statutory decisions... Uh, and that's the area um, where, of course, rightly there's been criticism over the way that has been done, and we do need to change that. A lot of trauma and damage has been caused, but equally at the same time, whether or not you know, the basis on which those decisions are being made, we all want to get in earlier, everyone. We all want to change the situation where there's been uplifts in the first place, but we also need to keep an eye on when those decisions are made, who should that sit with? Sorry, Thomas, on, yes. On Wellington, uh, the, the Mayor of Wellington has been spotted putting up tents at Shelley Bay, uh, assuming in protest against the decision by his own council. Uh, would you ever consider putting in a commissioner to run Wellington City Council? These are not decisions that um, are taken lightly, and nor would I make flippant comment on an issue that is just for the council. So this is a council issue, yes. and I need to leave that with council. So when you talk of the commissioner, is a long, long way away. Oh, look, this, as I say, you know, this, these are issues that people are democratically elected to resolve and work through. We do not take lightly the involvement of central government and what are local issues. What about, yeah. what about with the Tauranga City Council? Have you, yeah. has uh, Cabinet discussed what you're going to do about that? Yeah, and again, as I say, because we don't take those issues lightly, we do need the Minister, because these decisions can be reviewed, to make sure that she's given proper advice before we make any public comment on that. It, it's fair to say, though, that I think all of us will be looking to what's happening in Tauranga with concern. Um, this is you know, a growing city um, who need to be providing critical infrastructure for their people. I know what's happening there isn't welcomed uh, locally um, because they're very concerned about what it will mean for their city. Um, but uh, we are waiting for Minister um, Mahuta to receive some of that advice and make those key decisions. The time frame will keep relatively short, though. I'll come back to... Yeah. Are they New Zealand based or do 
So what I can tell you is that they were tested. Um, they were cabin crew. Um, they are, um, as I understand, New Zealand-based cabin crew who were tested on the 18th of November in accordance with um, uh, our surveillance protocols. Um, they tested negative. They arrived in Shanghai on the 22nd of November and returned a positive test as part of the routine um, screening. Um, they um, are reportedly asymptomatic um, in uh, isolation as all crew are when they travel into China. Uh, as I understand, I believe there may be further testing possibly underway, but I need to confirm that. Just on China, Prime just Minister. Minister. Just back on Joe's Jason. question before, do you have confidence in the chief executive of Oranga Samarit? Yeah, so look, what, what I've said here is that I think it would be wrong for us, and I've said this in the past, you know, these are, you know, these are issues that have been brewing for a long period of time. I'm not going to squarely place on the shoulders of one individual systemic change that we all need to take responsibility for. But I also do want to give Minister Davis the space in his own portfolio to work through the direction he wishes to take it. Prime Minister, oh, China, China, what do you make you of... Uh, Bernard. What did you make of China's comments following the Five Eyes statement in relation to Hong Kong, and what will that mean for our relationship? Look, it's not unexpected that these comments have been made by China. Um, what we have said, though, equally won't be unexpected uh, uh, from our side because we have been really consistent. What's been happening in Hong Kong is of concern to New Zealand. We have New Zealanders who live there, who do business there, who rely on that open system, uh, and we have been consistent in the statements we've made to China, um, both in open forums and bilaterals and also in written statements. Should it be taken then as tough talk simply from both sides, or do you expect there to be any tangible... My view, know, this is the sign of a mature relationship. We will raise issues when we see them. Uh, as all New Zealanders would expect us to do so, uh, and at the same time, I have a view that we can work through those, uh, and that's what we intend to do. But we do have an independent foreign policy. We do need to raise concerns where we see them, and it's uh, absolutely the right of China to then respond to that. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Bernard, I just said I'd come to you. Prime Minister, on housing, is it enough of a crisis that the government should relook at its 8,000 So, that, I mean, taken in its totality, obviously, it's, it's 18,000 if you take into account the existing um, goal that we had. What we have to also take into account is what we're able to deliver. We are working very hard to make sure that we have a workforce who is able to take on record consents in Auckland. Our house building program, which is already surpassing what any government has built since the 1970s, we've doubled the number of apprentices engaged in the last year. But when we set those goals, we also have to make sure we can deliver on them. We're scaling up as quickly as we can, but I'd be loath to set a number that I then couldn't reach. But those, those housing consents are actually lower to the population than we had in the 60s and 70s. Why can't we do much better than that? Well, again, we are very much trying to rebuild a sector that I, I do think has had a depleted workforce. Uh, and so, you know, keep in mind, we've also learnt from what we saw happened in the GFC. So at that time, uh, obviously employers, the shock of the GFC, they let go some of the training workforce they had. Uh, and right at the time when we needed a continuation of a house building program, we saw dips. Uh, and so that's why we've done two things. Subsidised employers to keep their trainees on. So we not only keep our workforce, but we grow it made apprenticeships free, and at the same time put in a scheme to help support developers who may have issues around access to finance to keep building, because we need to keep building houses. Okay. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll try and pick up those who haven't had questions. Just going back to the New Zealand crew that have tested positive, yeah. exactly who they've been the last two weeks and where they've tested? So, um, as I'd, as, it's important to reiterate, um, they tested negative on the 18th of November, but we are, as a precautionary approach, even while we await for retesting, undertaking uh, contact tracing. So treating it as you would expect us to, but keep in mind, only four days before they had that test in Shanghai, they had already tested negative in New Zealand. So two things to keep in mind. My understanding is they are being retested. 
Um, so as you imagine, we always want to make sure that we are dealing with a, with a positive case here. So they are being retested. We are contact tracing, and then we'll work through, of course, uh, uh, the source identification. The thing we always prioritise is before we find out what has happened, make sure we get everyone that we need to uh, uh, proactively get into isolation, into isolation. On the RNA, um, um, Janae. Uh, some of them are. Um, some of them have had applications filed with the panel and are being considered. Uh, others, the applications have not yet been filed by the applicant. Is there a breakdown of the numbers? Is it, was it 10 that are still in water storage plus 10? Uh, c can I I'd get back to you on the number? I, I thought it was 10 from memory. Hmm. Okay, last, yeah, last two questions. Yep. When you discussed paper 5 and mm. talked about the no, I kept it fairly general. So in total, our conversation was about 20 minutes long, um, and my reference to trade was quite specific to institutions such as uh, the WTO, the work we'd done there, um, and just the importance of those open uh, flows, particularly in the environment we're in at the moment. So not too specific beyond that. No, no, not in that call. But I don't expect it will be the only chance we have for conversation. We praise you for being a um, your leadership in, after March 15th, the COVID-19 um, response, and also being a working mother in a, a, a statement that you just put out. Oh. How did that feel? Um, well, obviously they weren't the things that I've decided to um, highlight um, because, you know, the substance of our conversation was very much directed towards our relationship. But, you know, those kinds of conversations all lend themselves to strong personal relationships, um, which are really important to us in the long term. Um, uh, but obviously it demonstrated that he, he knows exactly what's going on um, over here. Did he spot my bowel number? Um, did he spot my bowel number? That, that's not something that as a matter of course I would expect um, from... Uh, um, uh, a leader in the United States. Uh, we all, of course, have our own security arrangements, but um, uh, as you can imagine, in a first phone call, I don't necessarily ask for someone's phone number. Did, did you discuss his biography? The normal rules of personal <laughs> etiquette apply, <laughs> I have to say. Did you discuss his biography at all? You know, this is not his first attempt um, at, at, at being elected, and he's also had a lifetime um, wrecked by loss. And, and so you're suggesting that in my first call with the president-elect, I raise his unsuccessful points in his career in politics. Or, or, or his, <laughs> his journey to being the president. He, right. You always talk about your, you know, the fact that you're a mother, but that's that's not personal. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Look, and look, we did have some personal discussion, you know, quite a um, discussion about his Irish heritage, his um, views on, you know, his experience here in New Zealand, the fact that my grandfather and his uncle served in the Pacific, so yeah, there were moments where that it was, you know, well, it was very much an unscripted call, as you can hear from my readout. All right, thank you, everyone.